Hello, my name is Julian Perleko. I'm a National Master from the state of Missouri. And today, uh, this is a continuation of last week's lecture on the four knight Spanish, starting uh, with e4, e5, knight f3, knight c6, knight of, well, knight f6, knight c3, knight c6, and this eventual position, bishop b5. Now, um, we'll be taking a look uh, at some actual games, hopefully um, analyzing some interesting variations. But this, this, I, I just want to say this variation is mostly played to avoid certain move orders. So most people like playing the Royal Lopez with knight c6 played here. Oops. And, uh, and then they're very happy once they get here. And sometimes their opponents play knight f6, and they're unhappy because they don't want to play the Berlin after castles, knight e4, d4, uh, knight d6, bishop c6, dc, uh, de, knight f5, queen d8, king d8. And this position is um, very theoretical, lots of high level games here. Um, black is shown, is shown to be doing just fine. Now, uh, white, white thinks to himself, well, how do I, how do I avoid this? And um, one of the possibilities, although admittedly not one of the more critical possibilities, is to just play knight to c3, which is uh, the, starting, uh, the starting position of Artavia. And also a move order um, that white might want, sorry, uh, a, 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 an opening that white might want to avoid is the Petrov or Russian game after knight f6. And he'll play knight c3 knight c6, and then bishop b5. And we once again get into our uh, tavia. Now this is a game between John Nunn, a uh, famous British grandmaster, and James Howell. Not to be confused with David Howell. James Howell is a very uh, strong player from England, but um, not quite as strong as David Howell. Um, I don't think there's any relation. Anyway, So the game continues bishop b4, castles, castles, d3, d6, Bishop g5. This is the variation we saw last week. Um, to me, this is a little surprising that uh, it's been seen in so many high-level games, just because black gives up the bishop pair on uh, c3 for basically nothing. Uh, white's forcing uh, black to uh, take on c3, basically. Uh, what would you, the audience do here with the black pieces, other than bishop c3? Yeah, 97 is, is, is another variation. We'll look at a game here later. But why, uh, why might black want to play bishop c3 here? What is white threatening? Either the knight or the bishop. Yeah, that's correct. And also, it can be shown here that white can even do it in the reverse order by playing bishop f6. You have to play g takes because of queen f6 and knight d5. If the queen moves away, then you remove the defender and you take on b4 with a winning position. So that's why black usually plays bishop takes c3 here. Although knight e7 is, um, as I discussed last week, probably um, a, better, a better try for equality. But bishop c3 was played, bc, uh, queen e7. So uh, basically everybody that, uh, that's played uh, e4, e5 with black was taught to play knight d8, knight d6. I was taught this. Several strong players that I've talked to, they were just told, yeah, black is fine if he just plays knight d8, knight d6 and has full equality. Um, I have uh, uh, two very strong friends. They both, they both confirmed that's, that's what they were taught. But this is actually uh, very incorrect because white just plays rook e1, defending the e4 pawn, knight d8, d4, and white has the center and two bishops. So I'll ask the class what uh, what should white do after knight e6? How would you play? To maintain your advantage. Yes? D in the e5. Sorry? D in the e5. Uh, D takes e5. Now, I believe the problem with D takes e5 is I will take back on e5. And uh, what, what's your idea after I just take back? Because these pawns are not so good anymore, yeah? Now, you might think that you can just take on e5, but unfortunately, your bishop on g5 is hanging. So you have some tactical problems. But otherwise, yeah, this would be a very good idea. It just unfortunately doesn't work in this uh, precise moment. 
So you do need to save your bishop because um, black, just, black just attacked it. And uh, by the way, against other random legal moves, like if white plays c4 here, then black is perfectly fine after knight d8, let's say c3, trying to maybe put the bishop back on c2. Knight e6. Uh, yeah, already here, black is probably for choice just because he has very good dark square control. And uh, poten potentially, he's going to have very good control over the f4 square. So um, it's in this precise move order that white has an advantage, because after knight e6, White has two very good responses. Everybody at home already knows, but there's lots of new faces here. So um, maybe you can find it, um, find the best move in this position. It's a funny move. The real question here is, where do you want to put your bishop, right? Which diagonal? Like if you want to go uh, to h4 or anywhere else on uh, the c1 to h6 diagonal, and why? Where is the best square? Yes. Oh, the highest rated player is right. <laughs> bishop, bishop c1. Bishop c1 is correct. Now, um, the problem with bishop h4 is it relinqu uh, relinquishes control over the f4 square. So the, the knight possibly can jump there at any time, even now. Um, and overall, it loses a lot of control over this diagonal and doesn't really have a future. It's kind of just stuck doing its one job on the h4 to d8 diagonal, where it's not that useful, because you don't really want to trade off for the knight. Because if you do, like if you were to play bishop f6 here, then uh, black would be clearly better because white has no compensation for his destroyed structure, right? He doesn't have the bishop pair anymore, so he's just worse. Um, and on h4, it doesn't really have, it has two, po there's two things that could possibly happen to it. Either it's going to trade itself off for the knight on uh, f6, or eventually it's going to be kicked back to g3 where it's just stuck and bad. So that's why h4 is bad. Um, now, the other two squares on this diagonal, because f4 is out of the possible, I mean, it's not even an option, right? I take the bishop. So we're just, there's three squares, e3, d2, and c1. And why we pick c1 over uh, e3 and d2? Well, on e3, there's a problem. What's the problem? Knight e4. Knight e4. Yes, that's correct, knight e4. So the pawn's hanging on e4, right? So bishop e3 is not possible. Uh, why is bishop d2 maybe not the best? Yes? Oh, sorry. Well, there's nothing concrete, but the bishop blocks the view of the queen. So the queen doesn't see as much. And the bishop really isn't better on d2 than c1, but it makes all the other pieces in white's position worse. The knight on d2, uh, sorry, the knight on f3 no longer has the d2 square. And uh, I mean, white overall has less control over the d5. So bishop c1 is the best move. Uh, c5. And once again, I'll ask, what is the best move for white? Very similar theme to bishop c1. A, a move that Ben Feingold would approve of. Claudio already knows. Yeah, that's correct. <laughs> no, bishop f1 is correct. Uh, bishop c4, the problem with bishop c4 is, once again, you don't want to trade off your bishop for the knight, because then you have no compensation for the uh, damage structure, right? Um, and the bishop on c4 is probably going to get hit later by a6 and b5. So it's a target. And also, um, what, what is the bishop actually doing on, on uh, c4, right? Like, it's not, it's not really on a good diagonal because there's so many things in front. Uh, in fr like, it's not really active, yeah? It's not doing anything. Uh, it may as well be on f1 where it's out of the way of everything and it's not, like, exposed. And the bishop on c4 is not protected, right? Which is, I, I mean, <laughs> might not be important now, but it could be later. I mean, I'm always scared. 
So bishop, bishop f1 is the best move. Um, can somebody tell me why maybe this move would be potentially bad? So it takes and white white takes on e5. So black black has a tactic here. That's correct. Attacking the bishop, which is exposed on b5, and the knight on e5. So once again, what, that's another reason to bring the bishop back to f1. It's just out of the way. Maybe in some variations, I can take on e5. Rook d8 is played. Now, obviously, if I take on e5, uh, I can't take back because my queen is hanging. Yeah. So rook d8 is a good move. It prevents uh, d5. g3. Um, G3 is played. Uh, why do you why do you think G3 is played? What might be the reason? Yes. Stop back rank checkmates. Yes, potentially you could be stopping back rank checkmates in the future, but um, anything else like uh, anything else that it does because H3 also. So why would G3 be preferable over the move H3? Yes. It helps. The bishop has a lot of scope along this diagonal. It doesn't have a lot of scope here. So the bishop's actually misplaced on g2. So that it, it doesn't really help the bishop get to a better diagonal or a better square, but it does do something to one of your opponent's pieces. Yes? That's correct. So you also kind of kill the play of your opponent's knight by preventing it from ever coming to f4. So this move is um, restricting your opponent's pieces. So uh, next move is knight c7. Uh, black is basically just shuffling here. Um, maybe, maybe black's thinking about playing b5. Uh, that's why a4 is played. But overall, he's just kind of sitting back and waiting for white to do whatever he's going to do. This is the kind of position I really don't like playing. With the black pieces, I really like having white here. Because I'm di uh, if I'm white, I'm dictating the play here. And black just kind of has to react, which is why white is slightly better. Actually, more than slightly. But bishop g4 is played, d5. Now, it might be weird uh, to close the center when you, uh, when you have the two bishops. But on the other hand, potentially, the knight could be coming to the c4 square. Where it would be very, uh, it would be very nice, um, and you have more space, so you're kind of hoping to achieve the pawn break, f2 to f4. When that eventually happens, the position will open, and your two bishops will become monsters. So rook goes to f8. Why does black play rook f8? What is Black's idea, potentially? Is he just moving back and forth? You know, no plan. If not. Yeah. So what? You, so if if you move your knight, you want to put pressure on this knight, right? And uh, how does this move help that? You're, you're onto something, actually. There is an idea here. So black. So when there's this structure, right? This defined structure, where um, because you want to look where the pawn ch chain is pointing, right? To see where you're playing. White's pawn chain is pointing in this direction, so he's playing on the queen side. In theory, of course, he's also he has more space, so he has more leeway where he's playing. But black's pawn chain is, I mean, okay, the pawn on c5, usually in King's Indian structures, the pawn's on c7. But the pawn chain is pointing this way. So black's going to play on the king side. So the pawn break you want to achieve is f7 to f5, and the rook on f8 helps support this break. So that's why rook f8 is played. Um, white recognizes uh, the potential da danger and tries to kick the bishop away immediately. The bishop goes away. Um, 
uh, to d7. Bishop c8 is also very interesting, giving the d7 square to the knight. Um, bishop h5 is a mistake for the same reason bishop h4 was a mistake, because I just eventually the bishop gets trapped on uh, the g6 square. So bishop d7, knight h4, going for the f5 square, uh, potentially also uh, trying to achieve this break f4. And um, last week uh, in the game between uh, Karpov, sorry, Svidler and Karpov, the knight rerouted itself to g2, and it was very powerful there going to e3, uh, supporting maybe a bishop c4 later. Here it's not so important because this diagonal isn't open, but uh, f5 could be um, uh, could be a good point to uh, to pinpoint. <laughs> I don't know. Knight e8. It's also preventing Black from playing f5. C4 preventing any b5 uh, potentially. G6. Black of course is trying to play for f5 um, with Knight g7. So f f4 is played. F6. Now it's in this moment that you have to kind of choose. What do you want to do with the white pieces? What type of game do you want to play? How would you proceed with the uh, in the current position if you were playing this with white? And so, where do you want your pieces? Uh. Well, the first question I want to ask you is, which structure do you want to play? Like, what kind of position? Do you want to take on e5? Do you want to leave the pawns where they are? Do you want to play f5? Uh, because there's some tension here. You can, you can either resolve it or you can leave it. It's up to you. But where do you want your pieces? You said you wanted to bring this rook where? No, I was thinking that the, the e rook or the g or the queen could move it forward and then bring it over so that when these pawns get out of the way, they're in their position. To, to yeah, it, it would be very nice to bring like, the rooks over to the king side, right? Or something along those lines. But how, like, if, if that's what you want to do, which structure do you want to play? Like, what type of position? Yeah. Because you have a choice. You can take on e5, you can play f5, you can leave it. So if you bring your rook, rook in right now, right, it's not going to do a lot because the g file isn't like even close to being open, right? And there's nothing really to attack. Black doesn't have like a clear weakness. White has clear weaknesses, right? Like c4 and c c2 um, and c3. Everything on the c file could potentially be weak. But black. Black does not have anything in his position that would be um, classically weak. He just has less space. So how would you proceed? Claudio? Huh. So the problem with these plans, I think, is, well, first of all, if you bring your rook over this way, right, you have to deal with this problem somehow, right? Well, yeah, yeah. Well, what about the other rook? The other rook, so bishop d3, this pawn is hanging, right? But if you if you play king h2 and bishop d3 and put your rook here or something, that's that that could be an idea, right? But w what do you do after that? So let's say I give you, I give you all this, right? So king h2, bishop d3, rook f1. How do you proceed? What's your next step? I mean, let's pretend black just passes. <laughs> You're already in that position. I, I don't know. I don't know if it. I don't know if it helps. <laughs> I mean, maybe it does, but I don't. I don't see how it helps. I think. I think that. Um, basically, White wants to define the structure now, or I mean, you could do it later, but. Uh, you should you should play what was played in the game, which is f five, and because now you you're you're making sure that Black commits, to um, to playing g five. Uh, this tension isn't good for him if he weakens his, like the f5 square and this piece is coming in. But um, now I can tell you what, what white's plan should be. Right Now that the structure is defined, white's plan should definitely be to play h4 and then crash through on the h file. right? So now there's a, a definite plan that white can try to employ. So knight g7, h4, h6. Knight e3. So the knight is now improved. Now the, the knight is on its uh, ideal square, right? It's controlling the f5 square, the g4 square. It can uh, the knight has no better square on the board, 
you can't think of one legally. I mean, E6 would be nice, but unfortunately, we can't have everything in life, yeah. So king f7 is played, bishop e2, rook h8. So white is preparing to, I mean, these moves are all played just to put the rooks on the h-file. Queen b5 is just provoking the opponent. Rook, rook to h1. So white has achieved everything. Now it's time to convert. You put your knight on g4, attacking h6. Knight d7, takes, takes, rook takes, rook takes. And uh, it is white to play and win. What about like knight h6? And if I play, so king h8, knight f7, obviously, right? Yeah. OK, but if I play king, f, oh, no, king f8? Because, OK, knight h6, king h8. Uh, knight f7, king g8, knight d8, right? So that's that's pretty obvious. But what happens if black goes to f8? You, I mean, you can't just like, I mean, maybe it's nothing. Maybe it's. <laughs> it's possible. You know, right? <laughs> yeah, you. Of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, you know. Yeah, all right. So Claudio reveals all. Knight h6, king f8, knight f7. Attacking the queen and the rook anyway. So it doesn't matter that the knights uh, didn't go to f7 with check, because the queen on d8 is on prees. King f7, rook h7, and the game is basically over. Uh, white, white is infiltrated on the h-file, and he's collected a lot of material. Uh, white wrapped up the game quite nicely with just rook h6, Queen takes, and uh, eventually black just resigned because white burns his king in. He's going here and here, and yeah. I mean, black, uh, white has more rooks. <laughs> uh, by the way, a potential. Uh, so let's say bishop d7. Well, bishop d7, a5 might just be immediate. So like black might already just be in zone, zone but uh, there's a funny plan. So like even if like this happens, let's say bishop d7. You can play bishop g5 here, takes an f6. And then you take. And this is good for white because not only does he have more rooks, but he has more queens. Anyway, so um, what to take away from this game? Uh, I would not play this position with black in the opening. Um, I've given two examples, uh, one in this class and two overall in the, in the uh, Fortnite Spanish, on why this position specifically should be good for white. Uh, with bishop c1 and bishop f1. I think white has two bishops, very easy play. Uh, he, I mean, strategically, it's very nice. You, you just stop all of black's counterplay on the queen side. And then eventually, uh, you just play on the king side with f4, maybe knight g2. Uh, you eventually prepare it. Uh, in, this, in this example, it was very simple. White just played f5, and after g5, now this is a strategically winning position. Eventually, white will just crash through on the king side with h4. This is not a long-term defense for black. He's just kind of hoping uh, that you know his his opponent might not find the right plan. <laughs> so this position is just I, I think this is just winning for uh, for white here. Um, the rest of the game, I mean, it was pretty natural. Oh uh, yeah, so yeah, but you're not in time, right? Knight, knight g two, knight. Uh, yeah. By the way, what Claudio mentioned, this is how you usually respond. So like, let's say pass rook a three or something, then h five, and you respond to h four with g four. And by the way, these positions are always very unpleasant because, like, white might be able to sack. Like if you, because white has infinite time, he can put his pieces wherever he wants. He can put his king on a one. He can put both of his rooks on the king side. And then he'll take on g4, and then the game might just end, right? But um, that's like a dream scenario for black. Because here, you're not even in time. White just goes h4, and after h5, uh, you just take on g5. And you have a pass pawn on f5, and eventually you should break through. So anyway, let's continue with the, with the next game. Um, oops. Uh, a game that I really want to talk about, which is, uh, where is this game? Is it? Uh, yeah, it's Wei Yi uh, versus Rod, Rodstein. 
bunch of time. Uh, train. Okay, so we get to our starting position. Wei Yi plays the Royal Lopez. Rajin plays knight of, uh, knight of six, the Berlin, and Wei Yi avoids it with knight c3. A fan favorite at home, by the way. <laughs> um, knight d4 is played. So this is like the critical line. Um, Hopefully I'll I'll come back to bishop b4 if if we have time. I don't I don't know. This game's pretty complicated, and I definitely want to show this one. So knight d4. Um, you can't take on e5 obviously because you take on b5 and play queen e7. I showed that last week. Uh, bishop a4. The other variation was bishop c4, but this is the more interesting one. Bishop a4, c6, knight e5, d5, d3, bishop d6, f4. This is basic. Uh, sorry. This is uh, the beginning to a starting position that is um, very rich. Uh, a lot of tactics can occur. Both sides are playing for their goals. This is like this is why we play chess. Like this is a battle of ideas: material versus um, activity. Bishop c5, uh, e takes d5, castles, d takes c6. Um, it's not necessary for Black to waste time with knight takes d5. Probably that just lets White. Um, White get out with like knight e4, and then see a possible c3 later. So black just castles and lets white take all these pawns. But I mean, black is fully developed, and look at white's king. He's not castling this way, that's for sure. I mean, all of black's key pieces are there. And um, yeah, black takes back on c6. Uh, white needs to solve his problem, right? White needs to develop his pieces, and he needs to put his king in a safe position. Now, ordinarily, I mean, I would never, I, I would try to never show this game to beginners, right? Because they might try to do something silly in, in, uh, in their own tournament games. But here, after, uh, sorry, h3 is the best move, rookie 8. The way white solves this problem, because you don't want to go towards the king side, you want to go towards the queen side, but you just don't have time to prepare castle's queen side. So the way you solve that problem is by playing queen d2, knight d7, and king d1, which is very unusual. You don't don't try this at home. I mean, get to this position, try it, but don't do this like under normal circumstances. Um, why does this work here? White is giving up his material advantage in order to complete development because. White doesn't just have material advantages, he has positional advantages. If you look at the structure, white has a perfect pawn structure, right? This is one pawn island, right? This is one pawn island, and this is another pawn island. The pawns on f4, g2, and h4. I mean h3. Black, on the other hand, has split pawns on a7 and c6. And OK, the pawns on f7, g7, h7 are perfect pawn island. But if, if white gets to some ending where it's equal material, then he can press forever. So he wants to give up whatever material advantage he has now to play for something more tan, um, like something safer later. <laughs> so knight e5 takes, so white's trading pieces because he's getting attacked. Rook e5. Now, what would you play here with white? You need to trade off some material because otherwise you're just going to get mated. How do you how do you manage to trade off some of Black's attackers? E4. Yeah, actually, this would be very nice. So if the knight goes to e4, um, <laughs> oops, mouse skills not there. Um, if the knight goes to e4, it would be very nice to trade off the knight for the bishop. In fact, that would be just winning for you because you would have two bishops, and uh, I mean Black's attack is dead without the dark square bishop. Black would just move, but unfortunately, Black would just move his bishop away, right? And then, and and then the rook going to d1 would be another way to Yeah, um, this is actually the correct way. You should play rook e1 here. And knight e4 is a potential, uh, is, always, is always a move to consider. But um, rook e1 is stronger here because it actually forces the immediate trade of um, the rooks. I mean, unless you're putting your rook on h5 which is a very silly square. And then white will proceed with knight e4, as mentioned, followed by c3 and d4. Uh, white is just clearly better. Or you can move your queen to back up the rook. Yeah, if you move your queen to back up the rook trade, we still trade ro traded rooks, right? So white still achieved his goal. Um, I think the problem with do doing that specifically is that, is that if you, if you uh, 
put your queen on e5, then once my knight moves, I'm not sure, probably even this move, knight e2, starting another trade, um, your queen is, is going to be a target for, I mean, more tra trading threats with like queen f4 or something. A c3, d4 might come with tempo. Instead, black just trades on e1, queen goes to e1, and bishop f5 is played. Okay. Now, this is a key move. If white, I mean, white, I think, I think this is forced. If you don't play this move with white, you're much worse if, like, not lost because black's activity is so powerful. Although black's position is a little precarious. Yeah, uh, but where would you put your bishop? My first instinct might be, would be f4. f4. f4 is, f4 is a good square. Unfortunately, I think after bishop f4, so the problem with this move in general, like in chess, queen pawn openings, is this pawn, this pawn is like exposed. I think this move is strong, I'm not sure, but I think queen b6 is strong targeting b2. And if you protect this somehow, then I, um, I'll move my knight to attack your bishop. So like king c1, knight e6, this is just a variation on off the top of my head. If you move your bishop away this way, right, covering the e3 square from my bishop, then black has rook b8 attacking b, b2. So you might be able to cover with bishop b3, and then like a5 maybe, followed by, uh, no, sorry, probably here bishop f2. I think this position, like black's activity, compensates him enough for his material def deficit. Um, if not more, more so. I mean, I would rather be black. What about uh, queen e5? That's correct. Why queen e5? Uh, you're attacking both the bishops. Yeah, you, you, you have your eyes on both bishops. This one is immediately hanging. And, uh, the, and it, I mean, and it's just keeping an eye on the bishop on f5. Uh, the best move is bishop b6, and this position is objectively equal. You can look this up at home, but Black actually played a move which loses, surprisingly. And it's a very natural move, it's queen f8. Um, Black's a very strong player, rated like 2680. Of course, Wei at the time was only 2550, but nowadays he's like top 15 in the world. So he's no slouch. Um, what did Wei play here with the white pieces? So if you were to play Bishop e3, I believe that rook e8 is strong. E8, and then you can move your queen to f4. f4. So I believe that rook e3 and knight c2 wins. Although maybe there's something stronger. You know, your your queen is hanging and your rook is hanging. Um, is there something stronger? Let's see. I think. I mean, I don't see why that isn't good enough. Probably that's just good enough. All right. Yeah, just rook e3 and knight c2 ones. So um, instead, I mean, black is black had a point with queen f8. Like queen f8 is not like a stupid move. It's just it's not it's not obvious unless you know that it's obvious. <laughs> White has a, t a tactic here actually. That's correct, because you're removing the, um, I mean, the, the knight's overloaded, right? It's protecting the pawn on c6 and the bishop on f5. So uh, knight c6, queen f5, knight d4. Knight goes back to d4, and white, uh, white actually already has a winning position here, because black's attack has kind of died down, and he has um, a lot of material um, for seemingly not a lot. Queen f4, rook e8, bishop d2. The queen moved to e7, and I will offer um, anybody. Uh, Wei did not find like the most precise move here, but white has a very, very strong move here, which leads to basically a winning position. Uh, in the game, he played queen g5. <coughs> Offering yet another trade, keeping to the theme of this game. I mean, the only move I saw right away is the knight to b4. I don't think that's a good 
So I think everybody in this class would agree that the rook on a1 doesn't do a lot, right? And you kind of want to make space for your pieces over on this side of the board because that's, that's where, where they're going to live. Like the king's not going that way, right? The king has to go this way. And it's not safe right now. But if your king gets to safety, then what are you, like two healthy pawns up? So you would just have a winning position. Knight e4 and c3 uh, is not the, uh, you have something a little bit more uh, immediate. But knight e4 and c3 is also a potentially good plan, I think. I think the problem is there's, yes, that's correct. Yes, that's correct. So b4 attacking the bishop. And now, now when the bishop moves, you can protect your pawn. Uh, obviously, you can't take the pawn on b4 because the knight is hanging on. Uh, once you protect your uh, your pawn on b4, you can move the king to b2. Sorry. Uh, is there a question or no? No. Okay. All right. Uh, so anyway, queen g5 was played in the game, threatening a queen trade. Queen b7 attack attacking uh, b2, and maybe Black realized his mistake, and now he's preventing pawn to b4. Well, I mean, <laughs> pawn to b4 was played anyway, but it's not as good now as it was in uh, this position. Uh, b4, bishop goes back to b6. Um, taking taking with the bishop allows rook to b1, where white uh, white gives up a pawn for activity, right? But um, black didn't want black uh, sorry black didn't want white to have any activity. He just wanted to play with the compensation. Um, so just bishop b6, uh, queen b4, rook b1 is the same. Like white is playing like he's giving up material to get uh, some development back. So bishop b6, queen d5. Queen c7, king c1, and the king goes to b2. So we eventually found the right plan, although um, a little bit, a little bit late. Queen c4, queen g3, king b2, queen g2, knight e4. Um, so knight goes to e4, obviously to protect the bishop, but um, it also does something else. So after queen h3, I will once again ask. What tactic? Uh, there's a tactic here for white. It's white to play and uh, uh, regain his advantage. Claudio already knows. Yeah, Claudio knows. I'll give I'll give the rest of the class maybe 20 seconds. Do you know? Knight g5 is the correct theme, but in, it's incorrect here because if you just play knight g5, I move my queen to h5 or f5 defending f7. But you are on the right track. Notice that the g5 square connects the f7 and the h3 square. It's white. Yes? Mm. So after knight d6, what happens if I play rook d6? Queen c. And if I play queen c8? Yeah. Yeah, occasionally queens can move backwards. They recently patched that into the game. Just kidding. <laughs> That's correct. Queen f7. Uh, oftentimes, in, oftentimes in tactics, if uh, you see like a move order and it doesn't work, you can reverse the move order and it does work. So like knight g5 didn't work because the queen just moves to protect f7, but queen f7 is a forcing move, um, basically uh, forcing black to play king f7, knight g5, and you get to this um, ending where white has an extra pawn. And it's a very uh, unbalanced ending where it's uh, four, four on one and two on zero. White has a, an obvious edge just because he's a, up a pawn, but I mean, this is, far from the end. Knight f3, bishop f4, bishop d4, c3, bishop goes to f6. So black has just weakened white's entire structure. White plays knight f2 attacking, uh, sorry, protecting the d3 pawn, bishop h4, bishop e3. Um, you can't just take on f2 and take on d3 because a7 is hanging. And as you might know, in um, race positions, 
where there's pawns on both sides, um, actually, I'll ask, which piece would you rather have, a bishop or a knight? All right, let's have a vote. When there's pawns on both sides and it's a race, who wants to have a knight? Raise your hand. Nobody raises their hand. I, All right. I who like votes? Game, who I votes for Buchanan? Sure. All right, enough. All right. But it um, depends where the knight is, where the board is. So, I mean, yeah, bishop can get there faster in general. If, if it can block. That's All right, in general, bishops are better when there's pawns on both sides of the board. Knights are better when the pawns are on one side of the board because, you know, the knight's a short range piece, so it does like a lot of damage, right? It can go to both color complexes. But bishops in, in this position, uh, black would just be losing. Like bishop f2 is a horrible move and taking d3 uh, because this bishop sees these pawns from really far away. This knight has to travel all the way over here to stop this pawn. That takes a long time. The bishop can do that in one move. The knight takes like a thousand. I mean three or four, but whatever. Actually, how many squares? It's, like, it's five. All right. Anyway. Anyway, um, anyway, so rookie rookie eight was played. Uh, so now, if you take a seven, what would black do? Yes. Rook the stage. Yes, that's correct. And if you and if you move, then what happens? Continue your line. Bishop into f two. Yes, that's correct. And black just wins a piece. Um, it's true that. Bishops are better than this. Is also a very interesting ending, but black is the one on the better side of it now, having an, an extra piece. So uh, anyway, after rook e8, knight e4 was played. Black plays the move knight e1, winning uh, winning the d3 pawn because after rook d8 a6, there, white has no good way of protecting d3. A4 was played. White doesn't really care about protecting his pawn. The thing that matters in these race positions is time. Whoever has the most time, like if my pawns are on b7 and a7, I win. Right, or uh, b8 and a8, even like more crude. But um, so black, uh, white sacrifices his pawn on d3 in exchange for like a little bit of extra time in this race, and objectively he is winning. Rook e4, b5, take take, h5, bishop d4 is um, is a very strong move. Uh, it cuts the rook's activity along the fourth rank. Bishop g5, b6. So white is ahead in this race. Bishop f4. Rook f3. Uh, rook h3 is the best move and white is winning, but okay, honestly what he did is is more than fine in a practical game. Um, there's some crazy computer line here that justifies why rook h3 is better than rook, f, rook f3, but there is a reason. <laughs> um, I believe rook h3, g6, and the point is that you're putting your rook here, which gives you like some additional time. But rook f3 is, is strong because after g5, king, king c2, king d3, um, what we'll discover is oftentimes in the ending, rooks are worse at stopping past pawns than bishops. Which is why this, this ending is better for white. I mean, white has more time, and um, he's actually queening with check. So c6, h2, b7, rook h3 was played. I, here was the last moment where, um, where black could have survived, although he would be much worse after h1 equals queen, and then white would make a queen. After rook h3, this is like forced mate in 24. Uh, way he did not find it, unfortunately. I mean, he's such a patser. Who doesn't find mate in 24? But, <laughs> or whatever, whatever absurd number. But he, uh, he found a very concrete way to win anyway. He just, I mean, you, when you have queen, uh, when the queen can cover all the light squares, the bishop covers all the dark squares, you can find mating nets. So here, black's king is so weak. After queen h8, king g6, queen f6, king h5, queen f4, uh, queen f5, um, king went back to h6. They repeated a couple times. He took f4 just to be safe, and then he eventually uh, put his queen on e6 and just played c7 because now that his queen now that his queen's on f6, he can block with bishop c3, and well, he's going to have a new queen on the board soon. Rook h4, king, uh, king d5, queen d1, king c5, queen g1, king b5, and eventually he will get to a safe square. Uh, you block on a6, queen b5 check, queen b6, king 
king b8, and um, now you'll see why uh, the bishop on the wall diagonal is so useful, stopping rook h8. It's, there's now no way to prevent c8 uh, queen. Um, I would highly recommend, uh, this was a lot of fun for me, just like personally analyzing this, this ending um, alone at home. I would recommend everybody to, to analyze this ending. This is, this is really fun. But um, yeah, unfortunately, I think that's all I have time for tonight. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, this was Julian Perleko, uh part two of the Four Nights uh, Spanish. <laughs>